Paul. What are you doing here? Late at night, I heard noises from upstairs, so I went up the stairs and came across my husband coming out of our daughter's room. He looked surprised to see me. Uh, yeah. I heard the noise too, so I went into Emma's room. Turns out she was crying because she had a bad dream, so I was comforting her. It's hard to believe that a daughter who's been avoiding her father would seek comfort from him just because she had a bad dream. His explanation doesn't quite add up. And then, my husband started visiting our daughter's room more often at night. When I asked him what he was doing, he always said our daughter couldn't sleep and wanted him to stay with her. In the morning, my daughter started yawning constantly and seemed to be more absent-minded. I also noticed that her waistline appeared fuller. I was concerned about these changes in my daughter's body. I confronted my husband sternly, and then my daughter spoke up. I've been enduring until now, but I've had enough. Listen to this. Where did you get that? You are an ungrateful child. Thanks to a certain trump card my daughter revealed, my husband was cornered into admitting his wrongdoing. My name is Kate. I married Paul, a senior from my university, and we got a daughter named Emma. Paul adores our only daughter more than anything and has been very attentive to her since she was little. Emma, in turn, has been very attached to her father, often going out to parks and other places with him even without me. When I was busy during peak seasons at my part-time job, Paul would willingly take Emma to amusement parks and other outings. No matter how busy he was with work, Paul never missed any of Emma's school events, such as sports days or parent-teacher conferences. In a world where many men prioritize work over taking care of their children, I am always grateful for Paul, who can be described as a model father. His dependable involvement with Emma makes me constantly thankful that I married him. However, as Emma entered the upper grades of elementary school, she began to distance herself from Paul, perhaps due to the sensitivities of adolescence. Hey, Emma, how about we go somewhere together? We could go shopping if you want. I'll buy you something you like. Paul made this suggestion to Emma, who was watching TV in the living room on a weekend. Um, no thanks. There's nothing I really want right now. Emma is a bit of a mature child, and lately, she's been saying that she feels embarrassed to go out alone with her father. Today, too, Paul invited her, but she seemed reluctant and declined his offer. I'm making an effort to invite you out, and this is the attitude I get. Paul suddenly scolded Emma, apparently upset by her reaction. Paul probably wants to get along with Emma in his own way, but he often misses the mark when it comes to understanding how to interact with girls, and then he ends up getting frustrated when things don't go well. Hey. There's no need to get so upset. I intervened hastily, trying to calm down Paul, who got heated. The argument between Paul and Emma wasn't limited to just this day. Emma often responded curtly when Paul spoke to her. While Paul was shocked and upset by Emma's change in attitude, especially considering how close they used to be, I didn't attach too much importance to it, rather, I saw it as a sign of her growth. She wasn't like this before. Well, well, she's just growing up. Don't worry too much about it, okay? I tried to reassure my husband, who seemed dissatisfied and muttered complaints. I didn't pay much attention to it at the time, but little did I know, I would later regret my response. If I had been more attentive to their behavior at this moment, perhaps the events that followed wouldn't have occurred. As Emma entered sixth grade, her relationship with her father remained tense. She grew both physically and emotionally, becoming quite mature. 
although she had many friends and a cheerful personality. Lately, she looked a bit down. When I asked if something was bothering her, she would shake her head and say it was nothing. Even when I contacted the school to inquire about her well-being, there didn't seem to be any obvious issues. On a night when I was lying in bed with worries on my mind, I suddenly noticed Paul stirring next to me. He got up and left the bedroom. I wonder if he went to get some water. I glanced at the tabletop clock on the bedside table and saw that it was midnight. Feeling wide awake, I rolled over in bed. Despite some time passing, my husband didn't return to the bedroom. Although I was curious, I felt drowsy again and eventually fell asleep. Did you stay up last night? I asked Paul while preparing breakfast the next morning. Uh, yeah. I couldn't sleep, so I was in the living room. Hmm, if you're having trouble sleeping so often, maybe you should see a doctor. Even though I suggested it, he responded that he wasn't particularly bothered and it wasn't necessary. Then one day, I once again noticed my husband had left the bed and gone somewhere. At the same time, I felt a dryness in my throat and assumed I was thirsty so I got out of the bed following him. When I went to the living room, it was dark and no one was there. Huh? Where's Paul? Without paying much attention, I thought he might be in the bathroom and I poured myself a glass of tap water, drinking it all down. As I was about to return to the bedroom, I suddenly felt like I heard some noise coming from upstairs. Is our daughter awake? Thinking so, I climbed the stairs leading to the second floor. Then, I encountered Paul coming out of Emma's room. Paul. What are you doing here? Kate, were you awake? Paul looked surprised to see me. Is everything okay with Emma? I heard some noise, so I came up. Uh, yeah. I heard it too, so I went into Emma's room. Turns out she had a bad dream and was crying, so I was comforting her. You two haven't been getting along, and now you've made up? Kids always love their parents, even if they act distant sometimes. She has calmed down now and is asleep. So let's go back downstairs. It sounds a bit odd that Emma, who has been avoiding her father, would seek comfort from him just because she had a bad dream. Despite the explanation feeling unsatisfactory, Paul urged us to go back to sleep, so we headed downstairs and returned to our bedroom. Since then, he started going to her room more frequently late at night. When I asked what he was doing, he always said she wanted him to stay with her because she couldn't sleep. I asked Emma if that was true, and she said that she had asked him to come to her room. Emma is a girl, so isn't it a bit much for her to sleep with her dad in the same bed at her age? Besides, isn't it going to affect your work if you keep waking up in the middle of the night all the time, Paul? Nah, if it's our adorable daughter asking then it's fine even if I lose some sleep. Right? Emma? Paul replied casually, seeking agreement from Emma. Um, yeah. However, despite agreeing with Paul's words, Emma's expression clearly appeared troubled, as if she was burdened with something. Seeing that both of them seemed to agree, I decided not to press further and stopped questioning. However, the feeling of unease that something was amiss lingered. Then, in the mornings, I noticed Emma becoming sleep-deprived, yawning frequently and appearing absent-minded, as if her mind was elsewhere. Emma's grades, which used to be top-notch, started to decline gradually. Not only me, but also her teacher at school began to worry. Hey, Emma, is something bothering you? You seem really distracted lately. I asked, 
concerned about Emma's well-being. But Emma just laughed it off, saying, It's nothing, Mom. You're just overthinking. Six months later, I went to pick up Emma from her cram school by car. Just as the class had ended, children started coming out of the entrance, and I spotted Emma among them, and then I noticed something. When I looked at her again from inside the car, I realized that because we are always together, I hadn't noticed it before, but she looked a bit chubbier. Ah, I'm tired. Today was a test day, so it was tough. Emma said as she got into the car. Good job. You must be hungry, let's have dinner as soon as we get home. Yay, I love mom's cookie. Hee <laughs> hee, it's nice to hear that. By the way, Emma, have you noticed any changes in your body recently? You look a bit plumper. My words made Emma's expression freeze for a moment. Yeah. I've gained weight recently, and my skirts and shirts feel tight. I haven't been feeling well either. Is that so? I'm sorry, I didn't notice at all. We shouldn't ignore this, it could be something serious. Let's go to the doctor tomorrow, okay? I could tell she was somewhat absent-minded due to lack of sleep, but it was quite alarming to see changes in her body. When I spoke in a hurry, Emma's expression suddenly changed to a startled look, then she forced a smile. Just kidding, Mom. I was just hoping you'd worry about me a little. Maybe I'm just tired. Really, it's nothing at all, so forget about it. Seeing my daughter trying to brush off her earlier words and actions only made me more anxious. Could it be? Emma's clearly unnatural behavior made me feel like I finally understood the true nature of the accumulating sense of unease I had been feeling until now. When we got home, Paul was in the middle of a phone call with someone. Stop with the absurd accusations. He angrily shouted at the person on the other end of the line before abruptly ending the call. Who were you talking to? You sounded really upset. It's nothing, just a wrong number. Don't worry about it. He laughed it off and said he was going for his usual walk, then left the house. Concerned about Emma's state and Paul's attitude, I felt something was off. I decided to check the phone he had been using to make the call earlier. This. This number is... I searched through the call history and looked at the phone number displayed on the screen, feeling bewildered. It was the number of the elementary school where my daughter attended. Why would Paul be so openly angry? What could they have been talking about? And why lie about it being the wrong number? Feeling increasingly anxious, I knew I needed to confirm things. I dialed the elementary school's number. Identifying myself as Emma's mother, I inquired if there had been any issues concerning my daughter. As I listened, it became apparent that the person Paul had been speaking with earlier was the nursing teacher. The nursing teacher picked up the phone and explained the situation. Upon hearing it, I was left speechless with shock. During the recent health checkup, we noticed that Emma had shingles all over her body. I mentioned to your husband earlier that it could be stress-related, but he abruptly ended the call, insisting that your daughter was fine. The teacher's tone was quite urgent. Despite this, I couldn't understand why Paul had adamantly denied it. His strange behavior made me suspect that Emma's deteriorating health might somehow be related to him. I felt an urgent need to uncover the truth as soon as possible. With that in mind, I made a request to the school nurse. Thankfully, the teacher graciously accepted my request, all for the sake of Emma. I'm home. I need to talk to you about something. 
Why do you look so serious? Paul laughed, oblivious to my serious demeanor. The person you were talking to earlier. It was a teacher from the school, right? Why did you lie about it being a wrong number? Paul seemed startled, probably not expecting me to call the school again. Well. Um. You know, you're worrywart, right? I heard what they had to say, but it was nothing serious, so I didn't bother telling you. How do you know it's nothing serious? Huh. Emma looks perfectly healthy to me. Accusing her of being sick is ridiculous. Paul became defensive, arguing against my words. Accusing her? The fact is, there's been a change in Emma's body due to some kind of stress. You know something about it, don't you? That's just an accusation. I don't know anything. And Emma hasn't said anything either. She hasn't said anything? And who's been intimidating her into not speaking up? While you were out for your walk, Emma told me everything. There's no point in playing dumb anymore. After hearing from the school nurse about Emma's condition, I immediately talked to Emma about it. At first, she was reluctant to speak up, but with patience and reassurance from me, she eventually broke down in tears and confessed something to me. She was forced by Puel to sleep with him in the same bed. While it might have been acceptable when she was younger, Emma is already in sixth grade. Even though Paul is her father, she must have felt uncomfortable sleeping with the opposite sex. At first, Emma also resisted and refused. However, Paul shouted, The reason our daughter doesn't listen to me is because of your poor upbringing. He threatened to divorce me and kick me out of the house if Emma didn't obey him. Emma, not wanting me to be thrown out, reluctantly complied with Paul's orders. But just the thought of sleeping next to him made her feel suffocated, and as a result, she developed shingles all over her body due to the stress. The symptoms of shingles include severe body pain. Because of this, Emma couldn't fall asleep at night, and even when she managed to sleep, her father would appear in her dreams, yelling at her, preventing her from getting any rest. She always seemed drowsy and unfocused because she couldn't get proper sleep. And Emma confessed that she would sneak out at night to steal food from the refrigerator, trying to distract herself from the stress. That's probably why her body shape suddenly changed. You. Did you tell everything? I told you not to tell anyone. Paul shouted angrily, attempting to grab Emma. I hurriedly jumped in front of her to shield her. I won't let you lay a finger on her. Stop hurting her any further. Hurting her? That's an exaggeration. I haven't done anything inappropriate. Sleeping together is just a form of bonding. What's wrong with a father sleeping with his daughter? Emma clearly showed signs of discomfort forcing her despite the physical reaction to stress. It's laughable to think someone who ignores his daughter's feelings could call himself a father. I can't go on like this with you anymore. Faced with my anger at his selfish behavior, Paul suddenly began to flounder in panic. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. He probably realized the seriousness of the situation just now but it was too late. I couldn't forgive Paul for hurting our daughter's feelings. I won't forgive you. There's only one thing you can do, disappear from my and Emma's lives. No. I just wanted Emma to be close to me like before. Please don't abandon me. Paul collapsed to the floor, sobbing uncontrollably. Emma and I looked down on his pitiful figure with cold eyes. After hearing more details, 
Paul explained that every time he saw other fathers bonding with their children during school events, he began to feel inferior, wondering why his own daughter was rejecting him. She used to be such a sweet, obedient child. Always following me around, calling me, Daddy. It was heartbreaking when she suddenly became distant. You've been so self-absorbed, ignoring your child's feelings. Are you even a father? A daughter distancing herself from her father is a sign of growth. It's natural to feel lonely, but it's expected to endure and watch over her. Paul began to convince himself that Emma's rejection stemmed from her mother's poor upbringing. He rationalized forcing her to sleep with him at night as a way to correct this supposed wrong education. Perhaps he thought that by spending nights together, they would return to being the close father and daughter they once were. It seems that Paul was already under a lot of stress at work, being held responsible for issues by his superiors and facing challenges with his younger subordinates not following his instructions. He lamented being talked about behind his back by other employees and confessed that he sought solace in spending time with Emma. His selfish reasoning left me utterly astonished. I understand that you were under stress at work, but did you have to push it to the point where your daughter's health suffered? That's unacceptable. It was just parent-child bonding. Sure, it might have been a little awkward for her at times, but calling it stressful is exaggerated. Are you still saying that? Fine. Let's have someone else assess Emma's condition from an outsider's perspective. With that, I picked up my phone and made a call. A few tens of minutes later, the doorbell rang. I let the person in and showed them into the living room. Who are you people, just barging into someone's house like this? The person I called on the phone was the nursing teacher. The teacher had been waiting nearby specifically to explain Emma's condition. As I planned, she arrived accompanied by a social worker from the Child Counseling Center. There are clear signs of stress affecting Emma's body. It's an SOS signal. The counselor stated firmly to Paul. That's an exaggeration. Anyone can get shingles. She's just a bit under the weather. Despite the teacher's explanation about Emma's shingles, Paul remained adamant, insisting, it's not my fault. In front of Paul's persistent denial, Emma, who had been silently observing the situation, suddenly stepped forward with a determined expression on her face. I've been threatened to kick you out, Mom. I've been enduring it until now, but I can't take it anymore. Listen to this. Emma took out her phone and started operating it. Then, Paul's voice began to play from the phone. It was indeed a recording of Paul threatening to kick me out of the house if she didn't sleep with him, just as she said. You, when did you get that? Are you trying to set me up? You're an ungrateful child. Paul, not expecting Emma to have recorded the audio, began to berate her in a panic. However, no matter how much he denied it, he could no longer escape the truth. After listening to the recorded audio, the social worker from the Child Counseling Center firmly stated that Emma's health issues were clearly caused by her father. Hearing a third party confirm that he was the cause, Paul froze in shock. You were using Emma as an outlet for your stress. But from now on, I will never allow that. As I declared this, Paul slumped down in defeat. That night, Emma was temporarily taken into the care of the Child Counseling Center. I entrusted her to the counselor and the social worker, and I was left alone with Paul at home. I once again demanded a divorce from Paul. Please, reconsider the divorce. I admit I went too far with Emma when she didn't want to. And I'm really sorry. From now on, I'll change. No matter how much you refuse, 
Divorce is inevitable. Do you really think Emma wants to continue living with you? Neither Emma nor I can bear to be with you. No. I won't allow divorce. Absolutely not. No matter how much I explained, Paul refused divorce to the very end. It seemed like we were at an impasse no matter what. Realizing there was no resolution in sight, I declared that I would discuss divorce through lawyers from now on. As I packed my bags, Paul tried to stop me, but I shook him off and left the house. I couldn't stand to breathe the same air as that man any longer. I decided to stay at a budget hotel for the night and to pick up Emma from the child welfare office first thing in the morning. Even though I got many calls from Paul, I continued to ignore them. There was no point in talking to someone who wouldn't listen. I blocked Paul's number. Despite Paul's continued resistance to divorce, he eventually hired a lawyer, and we ended up in divorce negotiations. However, with testimony from the nursing teacher and evidence of Paul's repeated harassment towards our daughter, the divorce was finally granted. Of course, I won custody of Emma. Paul persistently demanded visitation rights with Emma, but when I told him that if he wanted to visit, he would have to pay a hefty compensation, he reluctantly gave up. I heard through the grapevine that Paul continued to live alone in the house after we left. However, perhaps due to the shock of the divorce, he lost the motivation to work. He kept absent from work without permission and eventually got fired from his job. It seems that he lived dissolutely for a while, but he fell behind on bills such as electricity and gas, and the utilities were cut off. As a result, he had no choice but to sleep rough in parks. While I do feel pity for him living such a life, considering what he did to Emma, I cannot forgive him even after the divorce. I will never see him again in the future. And so, life as a single mother with Emma began. Being separated from Paul, Emma gradually regained her former lively spirit. Nowadays, Emma has become engrossed in K-pop idols with her friends and expresses her desire to study abroad in Korea. She has been putting effort into learning Korean, and seeing her return to her cheerful self makes me immensely happy and relieved. There may be challenges ahead, but I am determined to raise my precious daughter with all my heart to protect this smile. That's the promise I made in my heart.